Hi, welcome everybody. Um, it's now top of the hour. Um, I'm James McLeod, the Director of Community at the FinTech Open Source Foundation, um, otherwise known as FinOS. I'd like to welcome everybody uh, today for our FinOS virtual meetup, um, where I'd like to introduce Andrew Aiken, Global Open Source Practice Lead at Wipro, who are also a FinOS member. And uh, Andrew is also an open source readiness contributor into one of our projects. Um, so it's really great to have you here, Andrew. Um, Andrew is presenting financial services after COVID-19, open source paves the way. Um, but before we actually go into Andrew's talk, um, I'd like to let people on the call know that as Finos, um, we're going to be giving away um, two t-shirts at random to um, two people who have registered uh, for today's webinar. So if you haven't registered, um, feel free to go over to finos.org um, and find uh, the article where this was actually publicized. Register yourself and be in for the chance of winning uh, one of two t-shirts, um, which has got a lovely Finos logo on it. Um, also, remember to find Finos on LinkedIn and also on Twitter, where you can follow us and um, get all of the latest updates um, as to what we're up to in our projects and also future events. Plus also, whilst you're on finos.org, you can visit our Get Involved um, page to uh, learn more about how to join the Finos community. And you can also register for Finos newsletters. And if you are a developer or an engineer, um, feel free to go to github.com forward slash Finos where you'll find the Finos organization and you'll see a wealth of different projects in there that you can actually start engaging with and start contributing to. Now, as host of the webinar this afternoon, I would like you to ask as many questions as you would like, but if you can put those in chat um, to everyone, I'll pick those up and I'll forward those over to Andrew who will be speaking at the time. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand you over to Andrew Aiken. Um, Andrew, it's over to you. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much for that introduction, James. Uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing some of this, the inform information today. I think it, hopefully you'll find it very, very topical and, and timely and, and relevant and hopefully get one or two ideas from it. Uh, this is one, what we call one of those lightning talks. And so uh, I'll be chatting, I'll be presenting for about 15 to 18 minutes. And as James said, would like to make this very conversational. So please do feel free to to send your questions to chat uh, and uh, James will, in, <clears throat> James will inter interrupt me as I go through my presentation here and I'll be happy to an answer them. So <clears throat> a little bit more about my background. This is actually my 21st year in open source. And uh, I, I do believe I was probably the, one of the first people to, to wear a suit uh, in open source after the original uh, leaders and founders of, of the movement uh, the, the folks with the, <clears throat> the evangelists and the folks with the, the knowledge and passion to create this whole new uh, technology and, and way of building software and licensing model and, and so on. And I came in right, right after a lot of the original founders and again, uh, probably, probably the first person to wear a suit in, in open source. So <clears throat> I'm going to share a bit of information today uh, around the, uh, our, our journey. Uh, as, as an industry and as a society through COVID. Uh, I'll talk about uh, some of the elements or aspects and dynamics of, of open source and, and how I think they can really help us uh, not only uh, create a, you know, get through this in, in a much more smooth manner and, and also present us with some opportunities. So that's really the, the, the gist of, of the presentation. We'll focus on three three particular aspects of, of open source that I think have real efficacy for today, and that's around cost optimization, inner source, and community engagement. So as, as we know, and for those of you who are, who are in financial services today, you're, you're probably much more aware of this than I am, but broadly speaking, COVID is having an impact across regulatory, regulatory and governance issues, financial, obviously, uh, operational, and, and the people. And uh, for today's conversation, regulatory and governance are kind of out of the purview of, of, of this presentation, but we'll talk a little about financial, 
uh, operational and the people aspect and how open source can have a positive impact on, on all three of those uh, elements. So <clears throat> in preparing for this presentation, I, I did a lot of research and I read through reports from uh, firms like PwC and Deloitte and Accenture. I read through our own internal analysis, which we produce. I read through what, what our clients are saying about, about the COVID journey. We really was able to, you know, really boil it down to kind of three different aspects or elements of the journey that we're going to go through. Um, <clears throat> different firms are at different stages of this journey, but essentially we have survive, which is keeping the lights on, making sure things work, keeping, keeping people working, keeping them happy, focused, motivated, and engaged. Uh, the second stage is around stabilizing. So that's building resiliency in your organization, in your operations, and taking a little time to reflect upon what your learnings are and what you've seen that's working and what's not working to help, us, help, help your organizations and your clients through the COVID journey. And then the last stage is to thrive, is to operationalize what you've learned works, to institutionalize it inside your organization, and to focus on innovation, creating the new business models, connecting with your clients, your partners, your supply chain in, in different ways uh, than you have in the past. And again, this is, this is my extract from all my readings. This is how uh, the, the lowest common denominator of our journey. There's another journey that we as a society are going through uh, during this pandemic. And really, in, in a pre-COVID world, in, in a pre-COVID environment, we, we were very focused on, on the physical world. And that has so dramatically changed in just the last three, three to four months. Today, we've moved to a much more, much more of a virtual world for all of our goods, services, supplies, even our human relationships and, and connections have become virtually in many instances, 100% virtual. Um, <clears throat> and as we go th along this journey, we're going to find a new normal. We don't know what that is, at least I don't, and, and, and most folks I don't believe know what that new normal is, but it's, going to, it's not going to go back to the way it was before. Okay, so, so post COVID, post this pandemic, we will find a new normal and it will be somewhere probably closer to the middle between uh, the physical world that we came from and the virtual world that we're experiencing right now. <clears throat> and open source has a, has also has a role to play in the societal journal, journey that we're going through. <clears throat> so today, as many of you are probably aware, open source already is a, a large part of the IT ecosystem for financial services. And it's, not, it's become much more than a set uh, or a collection of languages and frameworks and databases. It's recognized as having a much more of a strategic impact on, uh, on, on your IT ecosystems. Um, and it's, you have organizations like Capital One that are building the open source key software, building consortiums around it. You, in, within FinOS, you have Goldman, JP, Deutsche Bank, and others who are open sourcing really interesting pieces of software. So the financial services, despite being a highly regulated, typically conservative, conservative organization or, or industry, is really leading the way in open source today outside of what I would call the dot-com or the internet company sector, right? doing really, really interesting stuff. And in our experience, open source is really 100% penetrated fully at the mission critical production level in all financial services organizations today. The other, the other um, aspect to note is one of the foundations of open source, one of the reasons that it has to be continued to be taken even more seriously by financial services is this is where innovation happens. This is where developers are coming. When you look at platforms like GitHub and, and others out there, you look at foundations like Apache or Linux Foundation or fin part of, you see the growth in the developer ecosystem is incredible. 
Uh, just a few years ago, uh, the Octaverse stats from, from GitHub said they, were, they had around 10 to 12 million developers, now well over 40 million and continuing to grow. We're seeing in one study I did uh, a few, about six months ago, looked at the top 10 banks representation on GitHub and they had over 5,000 projects, top 10 global banks. So <clears throat> your industry, your vertical is deeply embedded in the overall eco open source ecosystem and it's only gonna continue to be even more, more important over time. So I'm trying to move forward here. So the journey we're on today can be made a little bit easier by open source. And this is what we're gonna talk about uh, for the remaining time. If you look at, at the journey to survive, stabilize, and thrive uh, elements, there are three key aspects of open source that can have a, a real positive impact for financial services organizations. One is what we call portfolio opt optimization. So that's and looking through your portfolio and identifying where open source may make sense to migrate to. And I've, I've put these arrows in here carefully to suggest where I believe that organizations should begin to take on this type of activity. Uh, if you're still in that survival stage, it's a bit early to try and look at shaking up your application portfolio. So get, get a little bit further down that path. Inner source which is the application of open source best practices with inside your firewall. That's something that you should begin looking at as quickly as you possibly can. And engaging more deeply and broadly across the, the uh, open source community. Again, if you're still in that survival stage, you might wanna wait until you get a little bit further down that path and then begin to look at how you can get more broadly engaged in the open source community. And let's talk about why. So again, portfolio optimization is really taking a close look at your application portfolio and trying to figure out and, uh, and understand where migrating to open source may make sense. Uh, some of the key aspects of this are really understanding what your existing uh, application portfolio with the with each individual application's value is to the organization, how it's being utilized, you know, are, are you using 10% of your current uh, licenses? Are you using 90%? What about the level of functionality of those applications that you're using? That's a key consideration here. When you look at open source, potential open source candidates, it's important to look at the vitality and the health of the community behind it. You want something that is definitely on a, a growth path unless you're, uh, when you're looking at, at moving, considering an open source application that would be in a production environment. If you're looking to use something that for more innovation or more development, then maybe you're a little bit less concerned about how mature the community is today and just more interested in, in the underlying kind of innovativeness of the core technology. And one of the, the most important aspects to look at when, when considering whether or not to move and uh, migrate to an open source application is really it, the complexity of integration. So <clears throat> sometimes it may take two or three uh, independent open source applications to replace the, fee the functionality of, of a piece of proprietary software. And so understanding what the level of integration uh, amongst, those, uh, amongst those softwares is really, really important because that, that's one of those uh, make or break type of uh, of aspects of, of, of migrating to open source. So <clears throat> some of the benefits that, that we've seen for organizations is really the ability to, to simplify and to modern, modernize your application portfolio, right? Uh, most open source applications today are, are based on a set of common denominator technologies. And so it does give you the ability to, to both simplify and modernize your portfolio. Um, there's an adage when you're looking at the cost of open source, it's important to look at TCO versus ROI. Because in, when, as you make that transition, sometimes the initial investment can take some time and energy and resources and cost and so on. And so the initial ROI might not be positive. But 
kind of the, the mathematical adage is that the more open source you use over the longer period of time, the more financial benefit will accrue to you. We do see uh, improved quality and security when moving to uh, open source applications and, and some people still hesitate around that security bit. Uh, if you look at all the studies uh, that have come out over the last decade comparing open source, uh, uh, open source uh, security violations versus proprietary, they're about equal. So the number of, <clears throat> of issues between proprietary and open sources is, is, is about the same, but where open source has uh, a very strong value proposition is in its remediation. So there is really no software company on the planet who can remediate a security issue as quickly as the open source community, and that has been proven numerous times. And then you also, um, by deploying open source applications, you, do, you can improve your business agility and your responsiveness just by the nature of having code that is open. It allows you to, do, to customize to specific existing needs and to anticipate future needs that proprietary software <clears throat> is not typically built uh, to, incor uh, to incorporate. And in our experience and uh, working with customers and also through the research we've done, we've seen improvements in the 10 to 20% range across all of, these, uh, all of these elements. In some cases, uh, we see TCO uh, reaching 40%. So let's talk briefly about, uh, about InnerSource and its value to financial services during this, this journey. So <clears throat> really InnerSource is the application of, the op uh, of open source development's best practices. So it's not about the technology itself. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Okay. So InnerSource is not about uh, open source projects or technology, it's about the development model itself. And so it's taking the best practices, it's about the, the culture, the processes, the methodologies and the tools and applying that to you know, in, inside the firewall, essentially creating internal open source communities. And the key benefits really are <clears throat> around its ability to drive collaboration, its transparency, and even the meritocracy, the ability for people who participate to have an impact and make their own decisions and really feel empowered. And the three key components are, are that ethos, are a set of processes. Processes have to include KPIs. There has to be a governance model. There has to be a risk model um, built when deploying an inner source program. And then of course, you have to have a set of tools that facilitate this, this collaboration and transparency. So some of the key benefits for financial services during this, this journey is the, we've seen an improved time to market, you know, collaboration across the value chain of, of innovation and product development and uh, product deployment. When you engage not just developers, but you engage you, your business community, your analysts and, and others in this process, we've seen significant uh, improved time to market. You have organizations like Kaiser that have, have talked about uh, anywhere from 12 to 20 percent improvement in their time to market. Uh, increased developer productivity, really the collaboration breeds energy. And this energy causes the developers to produce more code, right? And, and that's a, a key benefit of, of InnerSource. The improved code quality. So it's that adage of, uh, of open source, many eyes make for shallow bugs, uh, but many eyes also make people want to develop better code. So we've clearly seen for those organizations that are uh, operating through an inner source or have some inner source groups operating on an inner source model have definitely seen a real improvement in code quality. And then one of the challenges, particularly for financial services, um, uh, is this notion, you know, I've talked to a number of organizations and they say, we've got literally one organization said, we've got 400 uh, agile teams and we've managed to create 400 silos. And had another conversation with a, a large UK bank and they said, we have 600 
uh, agile teams, and we've managed to create 600 silos. So InnerSource is a way to create what, what I call a dis effective distributed agile model. Again, through this notion of, of collaboration and transparency, we've seen it have a real positive impact on, on agile during these times when there's so, when it, it, everybody has, has moved to a, a distributed or work from home model. This is something that can really have a huge impact on development teams for financial services organizations. And lastly, I want to talk about community engagement. Um, <clears throat> again, it's something that I, I highly recommend that uh, financial services organizations embrace more broadly. And it's really community engagement is both an art and a science, but the success, but being successful really helps with developer productivity and satisfaction, increased innovation, and higher quality and more secure software. And there are three aspects really. As you consume more open source, you are by default becoming more engaged in the community. The second stage is typically to actively contribute that maybe patches or fixes or documentation or, or whatnot. And then kind of the third step of community engagement is by publishing your own software. And that's a, we're seeing that become a, a, what I would call actually a wholesale movement within financial services. But, there's also something important to recognize when you publish open source, publish your own software is open source. We had one organization we were working with that was really, really enthusiastic about this and wanted to open source a number of their own applications. Uh, the challenge for them is that they hadn't even considered going to GitHub or other uh, repositories. Uh, applications they wanted to, to, to open source had already been, had already been done. And after going, helping them go through that exercise, they realized about some of the applications they wanted to open source had already been done as well or better than existed in, in the open source ecosystem today. So that's just one, one activity to go through before you consider open sourcing your own software. Now, <clears throat> some of the benefits that we see there is definitely improved recruitment and retention, which is critical today. Um, <clears throat> Developers simply want to work on open source software, right? That's, that's where we are. Many of the graduates coming out of school, that's what they've learned on. They expect to work on open source. They expect to work in a collaborative uh, environment, in a collaborative model, uh, and they just like working on open source. Uh, I would say probably 75 to 80 percent of the IT executives that I, that I have conversations with this is one of the first things they bring up as to why they're getting more and more involved in, in open source. Okay? And, and during these, these challenging times, this is a, a, real, a real benefit for, for your organizations. Increased innovation, uh, it's this notion of what I call secondary innovation. So you can take the existing innovation that, that open source has already created in whatever application that has particular interest, and again, this is something that I've heard directly from our clients back to me, large financial organizations said, one of the key values of getting engaged in the community is the ability to take, take, take uh, innovation that happens in this broader community and then tailor it to our specifics, our context, tailor it to the requirements of our particular vertical of our industry. And that drives this notion of internal secondary innovation. There's also the ability to drive increased productivity by engaging more deeply in the open source, uh, open source community. Again, this is how developers like to operate. Uh, <clears throat> and they want to be able to be active, to contribute, to be seen as active contributor. And so again, that helps drive productivity. And then lastly is trust. And that's one of the, one of the other takeaways from the research I did in prep for this presentation is this notion that financial services organizations need to focus on continuing to enhance or grow their trust in the brand within, uh, with their customer base and with their partners <clears throat> uh, in, in financial services. And so by being engaged, being transparent, being seen as an active contributor within the open source community, it helps build trust because your actions are visible and seen. And so being engaged in the community can, can truly help your brand 
uh, and help your visibility and again, help you grow trust. So I'll conclude it on that note uh, <clears throat> uh, that you really just wanted to share a, a few of the aspects of, 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 or elements of open source that I believe can truly help us all get through the, the pandemic journey that, that we're on and help us take advantage of what the new normal will look like whenever we come out on the other end today. So that's, um, that's amazing, Andrew. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and before we actually get to questions, so if anybody's got any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat now. Um, but before we get to that, I'd like to actually announce uh, the winners of the Finos T-shirts. So that gives some um, people a little bit of time to, you know, start keying in their questions in chat. So I would like to say congratulations to Natasha Fontali. Sorry, I knew that I'll trip over your name, so I apologise, Natasha. Font and Oliva um, from Broadbridge Financial, um, and Craig Rowe from Cantor Fitzgerald. Um, you have won a Finos T-shirt each. Um, we'll be in contact with you to get your um, name and address details. Um, congratulations. Um, so coming back to questions, Andrew, um, I have a question for you. Um, knowing that you've been observing, you know, how businesses and firms have actually been adapting um, to the COVID-19 situation, do you have any top immediate interventions um, for firms <laughs> that they can actually um, partake in now in order to, to accelerate into that distributed way of working? So I, I, I think it's in, in that second stage of the journey that I talked about uh, where we're trying to, and many, I know many financial services organizations have got through that survive. They've, they've implemented their, their, their kind of enhanced business continuity practices uh, is really take a moment to reflect on your open source footprint today. Are you just a consumer of open source? And, and historically that's been fine, but the industry is changing. Today you need to be more actively engaged and there's a lot that can be learned from the open source community. So I would say <clears throat> understand where you are today and then understand how, how you can get more benefit from a deeper and broader engagement. So that's amazing. Thank you very much. Um, and in your opinion, I know that um, Wipro are actually members of Finos. Um, would you recommend, or you know, would you recommend that people actually explore, you know, different types of foundations, you know, to understand how you know communities that are already engaging in open source, you know, can teach others how to, you know, engage in this way of working. Absolutely. We, we were the first global systems integrator to instantiate a focused or dedicated open source practice. And today we're a member of 10 plus foundations and probably active in 25 different communities. Uh, and yet we're still learning all the time. And one, one, uh, one thing to understand is not all communities, not all foundations are created equal. You can't create a an engagement model that of one size fits all. You have to understand the individual, the, the dynamics of how each one works, how you know code is contributed, how it's accepted, how it evolves, uh, who the key players are. Um, so again, we're even though we're fairly advanced, we're still on our own our, our own journey, our own learning journey, and and uh, learn something from the community every day. Okay, so um, I do actually have a question that's come in from uh, Paul Hunter. Um, thank you very much for asking this. So how is open source suited to smaller fintech startups and emerging markets where the community is less robust mm -hmm. and the industry is skeptical? <laughs> good, very good question. So uh, if I understand it, it's, it's regarding how do fintechs get engaged? Well, I would be surprised today if any fintech uh, if their offerings weren't partially based on open source technologies, uh, I, I just would be very, very shocked. Your offerings may be proprietary in nature, 
but I'm sure that some of the underlying components or foundation of those offerings are, are again, based on open source. So identifying which of those are important uh, and getting engaged. I mean, if, if your products are, are based on, you know, new innovative open source technologies, like, uh, uh, like a, uh, anything related, you know, many of these applications in the in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, related to the Kubernetes technology ecosystem, you know, if, if, if your offerings are based on some of these, you have to be engaged. You have to understand how and where and why it's evolving, right? So that's that's one step. And for those that are that are still skeptical, there's so much public data available today to help overcome that skepticism. Uh, whether it's around cybersecurity or compliance or support, support is definitely a challenge. Uh, you know, the, the demand for open source developers exceeds the capacity of those developers, and that's going to continue for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but there are still ways to build a multi-tiered uh, support model uh, that sh should help overcome some of that potential skepticism. Right, that's excellent. Thank you, Andrew. And we have time for one more question, um, which is coming from Amanda Brock of Open UK. Um, what recommendations does Andrew have for companies finding their way to inner source? There are, well, it's interesting Amanda brings that up. Uh, there are some public sources available for that, uh, uh, such as the inner source commons. There are some public case studies today. You can look at some organizations, like I mentioned Kaiser, and I think, uh, Thomson Reuters has actually been public about a use case and uh, I mean, some of the work they've done in the past. So have, so have others, uh, PayPal and so on. Um, so there is some, some publicly available information. There are a number of industry reports and research that's come out over the last couple of years. It's a really evolving um, technology model. Uh, and so we're, there's, there's always new in, information coming out uh, on on how it's being implemented, the opportunities, the challenges, and so on. Right, that's amazing. Um, okay, so we're actually out of time now, and I noticed that um, Eugene actually asked a question about recommending the different types of open source licensing. Um, mm -hmm. Eugene, if I can answer that one directly, um, feel free to um, come to uh, our open source readiness um, project within Finos, um, where that is actually hosted by um, the Finos Legal Council, um, a person called um, Aaron Williamson. Um, and you're more than welcome to actually uh, ask that question in there and, you know, get a direct answer. Um, I've got your details. And if you want to email me, I'm james at finos.org, um, or I can get in contact with you. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you very much to Andrew Aiken, um, Global Open Source Practice Leader, Wipro. Um, I'd like to recommend everybody here um, follows uh, Finos on LinkedIn and Twitter, and also signs, signs up for newsletters and gets involved in our projects at github.com um, forward slash Finos. Thank you all for being here today, um, and I look forward to meeting you all on the next virtual meetup. Thank you very much, and thank you, Andrew. Thank, Thank you. you.